once we get saved, once we have life, things begin to happen. First of all, we generate concern for our lives and our faith. When you have that newborn baby, it brings you great joy, but it also brings you concern. Now you begin to fuss. Now you begin to worry, right? How many mothers and fathers did we have here where you had to stay up at night? A lot of fussing and what have you, right? Of course you do. That's concern. Paul's got concern for their faith. But then you see the kids begin to grow and mature, and like this mother yesterday, you become encouraged, right? And you got encouraged as your kids began to grow and develop? Of course you did. And then did you ever pray for them? Did you ever pray that these kids would be a blessing? We experience God's life and God's love. And that's exactly what Paul is doing for these Thessalonians. Let's look at uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone. Now, he had to go from Thessalonica down to Berea. He went to Athens. And his body is in Athens, but his heart and his mind are back in Thessalonica. He's just worried about them. You ever get worried about somebody in your family? They're not there, you're worried, you're fussing, and you're fuming? Well, that's, that's Paul. He's worried about it. Well, he sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. So, I can't be with you, and I'm not sure how you're doing, so I'm going to send my trusted friend Timothy and incidentally, this was a sacrifice for Paul because when he was in Athens alone, he was really wanting Timothy's support. And when Timothy finally arrived, he felt a great joy and a great peace to have his fellow companion there. But his love for and concern for the Thessalonians was greater than his own comfort. That's part of parenting, isn't it? Something is easier and better for you, but if you deprive yourself of that and do the other, it's better for your kids it's called sacrifice, right? How many times mm -hmm. have you done that? So I made a sacrifice. He's really saying here, I sent uh, Timothy to you, verse 2. He's our brother and minister of God. He's our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ. And his job is to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. A number of times when Paul talks about Timothy, he talks about as being a brother. He defends him. He builds him up. And I think it's probably the youth. This Timothy was quite a bit younger than the other companions of Paul, and uh, some might have taken him not so seriously because of his youth. Paul wants to let him know he may be young, but he's strong, and he is my brother. He's a minister of God, and he's a fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ. And that's what all of us should be as well. We should be brothers and sisters. We're not higher or lower than anybody else. We are ministers. We serve, and then we're fellow laborers. We work together in the gospel of Christ. What's the goal? To establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. Let's not micromanage your life. Let's not nitpick about what you're doing right or wrong. Let's concentrate on your faith. Your faith, as it gets stronger, will access God. And God can take care of all these other details. I think sometimes we turn each other off because, frankly, though not perfect, I'm as close to it as this world would have, and you are not that perfect, and I've got to do a whole lot of micromanaging of your life to mold and shape you into the image of myself. That's an attitude that we have. We don't think that, but many times we do. We're always trying to make the other person much like ourselves, as close to perfection as we'll find here, this side of the throne. What a lot of nonsense that is. No, I want to establish you in your faith. I want to connect you to Jesus. I want to have you move in the power of the Holy Spirit. And when God can access your heart, he can clean up a lot of the details. If, in fact, he even wants to clean those things up. Some of the things I want to see changed in your life might not be of any interest to him. In fact, maybe I'm off base and even wanting to change you in that way. So concentrate on a person's faith. And a person's faith is a person's trust and belief in Jesus. So let's not micromanage each other. Let's work on people developing faith in the Lord. Why? Verse 3, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions.
for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. I want you strong in your faith because you're going to need it because there are afflictions, there are problems. Young people are going to have conflicts in school. They get older, they're going to have financial problems, they're going to have problems getting jobs, they're going to have problems in their jobs, marriage, what have you. You're going to need to have a strong faith in this life. Living in this life is not for sissies, is it? And you're going to have to have a strong faith. I don't want you shaken by these afflictions. Uh, you yourselves know we are appointed to this. The Lord promised us we're going to have tribulations. In this world you'll have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Second Timothy, as he's talking to his young friend, tells us in Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That's one of God's promises. I don't try to claim that in the morning. I know it's going to come anyway. Now, Lord, you promised me persecution. Come on now. Get on that texting of 40 people. Pray that Pastor Jerry has persecution. That God, no, I just, you don't need to do that. Okay, it's going to come. It's part of life. But we need to not be shaken. I like that word shaking in the Greek. And you think I'm making these things up because I have four dogs behind door number one. I am not. So many of these words have to do with dogs. I don't know why. The word shaken in the Greek means a dog's wagging of its tail. Now don't think about when the dog wags the tail as it's happy. But when the dog is hunting, my guys go into the woods, and especially the little terriers that are hunting, what do their tails do? They go back and forth. When they are confronted with something uncertain, their tails wag back and forth. And that's the Greek word, which means that we should not be wagging back and forth like a dog's tail because of the problems of this world. What can I do? I haven't got enough of this. I haven't got too much of that. What's the other thing? We go back and we go forth. When I take phone calls from people, and that's part of my job, to pray for you and to work with you, uh, you call and sometimes you're very, very concerned about a situation, understandably so. And you're shaken, and I can tell in your voice, and tell in the conversation. And one of the first things I have to do is get everybody calmed down and be at peace. I learned a wonderful expression from Angie, from her mother, uh, in Italian, state in pace. That's my lousy pronunciation of it, stay in peace. Let's all say state in pace, is that right? Stade in pace, all right, so now you know a little Italian. Okay, the only church today that taught you Italian, okay. So uh, st stay in peace, don't be shaken, but your faith has to be strong in order for that to happen. Verse four, for in fact we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened and you know. So he prepared them for this. When you get that newborn babe in Christ, it's good to say now you're going to be experiencing tribulation. Let me show you how to handle it. Warn them about it. For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. I was really concerned because of the trials and tribulations that your faith would waver. It doesn't mean you would lose your salvation. You cannot lose your salvation. But when your faith wavers and the tempter gets a hold of you, that all the good work which Paul had tried to do in their lives would have been lost because they wouldn't be living for Christ. They'd be living in the world, just tossed to and fro, like a wagging of a dog's tail. So temptation's going to be there. But the Lord is going to be there to see us through it, no matter what. Now, in verse 6, he talks about how he has been encouraged by their faith. I was concerned for your faith, but I got a report that you folks are doing very, very well. Verses 6 through 10. But now that Timothy has come to us from you, so Timothy went to take care of you. He has come back and reported. He has brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you. So what great news that was for Paul when Timothy came and said, Paul, they're doing well, they're standing strong in the midst of persecution, and they love you, and they're looking forward to seeing you. That's good news, isn't it? Verse 7, Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you, by your faith. Ah, here's the 
and the old Latin quid pro quo. This for that. I comfort you, and then when I have problems, you comfort me. Paul was comforting them, warning them about tribulation, having them look to Jesus, but Paul was going through his own tribulations, and when he heard that they were standing firm, that comforted him. So it's a two-way street. That's what I love about ministry. That's what I love about giving. Give and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, overflowing shall men give unto your bosom. Financially, yes, but also as far as love and ministry, you give and you'll receive. So uh, I'm now getting back from you what I gave to you. We were comforted concerning you by your faith. You are now an encouragement to me. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. That makes my life. How many parents can say, when my kids do well, I live. When my kids don't do well, I feel as though I have died or want to die. We are that wrapped up in those children. For what thanks can we render to God for you, for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God? Night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. So he says, what thanks can we render to God? How do we thank God for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God? How can I say thanks, God, for the joy of working with so many Christians over the years? How can you parents say what joy we have in our children? How can we thank God for them? We can't thank you enough, God, for the joy these children have brought to us. And the one thing you can do is pray. You pray for them. You pray for the new believers. Night and day, praying exceedingly to be able to see their face and perfect what is lacking in their faith. They're not around the throne yet. They're still growing. Faith grows, doesn't it? Faith is like a muscle. It needs to be exercised. If you don't exercise your muscles, they will atrophy. Use it or lose it, right? So faith must be exercised. We're praying that their faith will be exercised and they'll mature. And that's what the word perfect means. Not perfection, but maturity, because they're still lacking. All of us are still lacking in our faith, and that's why we're going to have more trials and tribulations today and tomorrow to develop and strengthen our faith. And then he closes with prayer for their love. Verse 11. Now, he's been talking about prayer. He gets right into it. I like that. Don't talk about prayer. Pray. And so he says, all right, let's pray. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So having mentioned prayer, he just launches right into prayer. I think uh, his day was largely spent in prayer, don't you? And so he's saying here, as he approaches God, the God and Father himself, and our Lord Jesus Christ, making Jesus equal with the Father, may he direct our way to you. By God's grace, we hope to see you again, because Christian fellowship is so important.